Did you know social media offers teens unprecedented access to lethal drugs? An enticing and colorful menu of offerings allows teens to order the drug of their choice straight to their door for pennies on the dollar. One of the greatest silver linings of this pandemic is that both my teenage boys are stuck at sheltering at home in their rooms. I was in ecstasy thinking these kids are completely safe and they're forced to spend time with me and it's all, you know, and I, uh, so I felt really good about it. You know, it never occurred to me that he could get drugs or be exposed to drugs that way or get access to them delivered to the house like a, you know a delivery menu and it says that you know to your house or shipped anywhere on the ad and it's not just that ad i mean when i tell you i had to start a, fa a facebook support group because of the onslaught of parents who are reaching out to me with exactly the same story that's dr laura berman you may know her as a love and relationship expert often seen on the oprah channel dr oz and the today show as well as an eight-time new york times bestseller However, through the tragic loss of her 16-year-old Samuel, we have come to know her in a whole new light. Today on The Balanced Voice, we expose drug dealing as yet another risk of unsupervised social media usage. In this heartbreaking conversation, we see the unintended but very real ramifications of social media and discuss the need for better regulation. Without further ado, here's your host, Renya Mancarios. Welcome to this very special episode of the Balanced Voice podcast. We are so thrilled to be joined by Dr. Laura Berman. Dr. Berman, thank you so much for being with us today. Thanks for having me. For those of you who know Dr. Berman, um, she's been in your homes through TV. She've read, she has eight New York Times bestselling books. She's affiliated with OWN, with the Today Show, uh, with Dr. Oz. She has her own TV shows and is internationally known for her work on love and relationships, sex, and more. Um, but a few weeks ago, we've come to realize and, and come to know her in a very different way. Her son, Samuel, um, lost his life on Super Bowl Sunday after ordering a pill off of Snapchat, a phenomenon that's taking place across this country. And she's been so um, thoughtful and selfless and sharing her story in the hopes that this would never happen to another child, Dr. Berman. Can you bring us back to that day and tell us what happened? Uh, yeah, and I should say that, you know, toxicology reports are not back yet, so we can't definitively say what he took. Um, uh, but the reason that we believe and have been told by the police that it is fentanyl is that, unfortunately, I've learned more about fentanyl than I ever wanted to know, but there is a specific to be graphic, um, fentanyl death pose in which we found Sammy and the police found him and the paramedics found him. And so um, because of that and the way he died, um, they know that, that, that fentanyl was most likely involved. Um, so uh, what, to answer your question, what, um, what happened that day was uh, he was in his room, you know, on social media, gaming with his friends, as we had been letting him do a lot because he was getting straight A's, well, almost straight A's, depending on the semester and, and really excited about college and really motivated and, um, even that morning had asked me to come to his room at some point during the day because he wanted to talk about an internship he wanted to arrange for the summer to beef up his college applications. And um, because of the shutdown in Los Angeles, we had let both our kids still at home uh, use, you know, be on their computers as much as they wanted, as long as they did well in school, because it's the only way they could be with their friends. He hadn't been able to play football. He was on the football team. He hadn't been able to see anyone. So that's how they interacted. And like most days when he wasn't in school, he was online with his friends. Um, he asked his dad for a hamburger. He called down and asked his dad to bring him a hamburger. Um, his dad did that. I ran out with my younger son to drop something off at his friend's house. And when I came back, I, I followed my son, my 15-year-old son, upstairs where both their rooms were. And my son actually walked into the room first and ahead of me and then turned around and said, Sammy's on the floor. And then I walked in and that's when I found him at first, you know, I didn't know what had happened. I thought he was, at, for a second, he was just being silly, you know, lying there on the floor because an hour and a half before, you know, he'd been talking to me. 
Um, and then I quickly realized that, um, you know, he wasn't responding. And then I saw, you know, vomit all over his uh, face. That's part of the fentanyl death pose is they faint, fall backwards, and then throw up and aspirate their own vomit. Um, and I started screaming for my husband. He came up and as he started administering CPR or trying to, I called 911 and they stayed on the line, you know, pacing out the compressions until the paramedics arrived very quickly. And uh, they worked on him for 30 minutes and were not able to bring him back. What was, you know, as a parent of three kids, you know, your story touched me so deeply and it touches so many across the country and it breaks my heart, but it also makes me so inexplicably angry Mm -hmm. because from what we understand, Sammy, like so many other kids was on social media um, within a click. Now you can order any type of pill, Percocet, Xanax, you, you name it. There was a a, a, a screenshot, I think at one point of a, a typical social media ad that these kids can look at, um, ambient perks, um, snow Adderall. And they deliver it to your house. That's what we found out while the police were still after he'd been, you know, declared dead and the police were still in the house waiting for the coroner. I was madly, you know, I was beside myself, but I was also trying to figure out what the hell happened. Um, because he had never done any, Uh, we caught him doing cannabis several months before and um, came down super hard on him, even had him working with a drug counselor every week remotely and talking to a therapist. And we were testing him regularly and we weren't finding any cannabis or anything else um, sporadically and regularly. And uh, so um, I, I called his best friend and I was like, and I told him what happened. And he said, well, Sammy had sent him a screenshot of a dealer he had met on Snapchat. I had no idea. The, mo- the thing I was most worried about with Snapchat and would always talk to my kids about are the naked pictures or the inappropriate stuff they may say, you know, and I know the reason they like it is because it things disappear. That's why all the kids are there, but it's like the dark web for kids. I had no idea that drug dealer, I mean, I should have known, but I, it didn't even occur to me that drug dealers would be on there. And so he sends me the screenshot that our son had sent him, which was, I think the menu you're referring to a very colorful kid friendly ad where they deliver it to your door. And it had the guy's uh, Snapchat and Twitter handle on it, the drug dealer's Snapchat and Twitter handle. So I immediately ran to the police. I got his friend to send me the screenshot, ran to the police upstairs, still in the hallway outside my son's room. And was like, here, now we can get the guy. Like, here's all of his information. And they looked at me and they're like, we're really sorry. Don't get your hopes up because social. we don't even bother calling social media because all they'll do is take down the profile you know, and then as soon as they do that, that person just pops up with a brand new screen name and keeps going and it makes it even harder for us to find him. And they won't give us any identifying information on, on these people. Um, they cite privacy laws and freedom of speech for doing that. And they're held, you know, un- they're not held uh, responsible for any of these. So they have no motivation uh, to help the police. And so that's when I really flipped out. And um, because I was not only just beside myself. I mean, I, I had bruises for weeks all over my body. I don't even know what I was doing. I think I was just throwing myself around the floor and keening and screaming. But when I found that out, I, I not only felt completely grief stricken, but full of helplessness and rage. You know, I was just like, there's no freaking way that this is happening and isn't being stopped. Yeah. And that's when I just, I don't even remember writing that post or finding the picture. I just did it thinking people in my little online community, at least a kid would might be saved. And it just took on a life of its own, um, you know, since then, which I'm overwhelmed by, but also grateful for, because I keep hearing from parent after parent that in many cases that their kid was actually saved by, by Sammy's story. Well, you've, you've let people into the very raw and very real grieving process that you're going through. Um, And I think that's rare to see because a lot of parents, you can't deal with this type of grief and you shut down, but you've actually allowed us into this journey that you're on. And I encourage people to go to your, your Instagram page and follow you and, 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 and learn as you go through this. 
This balanced conversation is made possible by Brigitte and Bashar Kalai, Hallie Vanderheider, Sippy and AJ Karana, and Deepwater Productions. If you're interested in furthering our mission of facilitating balanced conversations, offering real solutions, contact us at thebalancevoicepodcast.com. Here's where we are. Stories like yours have power to move the needle. Stories like yours draw so much attention and eyeballs. And so we're urging you know, communities to come together. One, to recognize that this happens. It's the Uberization of drugs at this today, at this very moment, any kid in any city. And, you know, we talk to people all the time that say, you know, oh, it's so heartbreaking, but my kid, straight A student. No, no, my kid is on the varsity team. My kid doesn't touch these things. No, my kid's actually home. We're super strict. And, and people don't understand that none of that has anything to do with this issue because any child can simply go on Snapchat, right, or any social media platform at this very moment, click on a post and get a whole host of counterfeit pills. What was what did Sammy pay? 15 cents? Is that true? Something like that. I mean, we'll, we'll find out exactly what he got um when the toxicology reports come back. But here's what is happening. And you're absolutely right. I had just said to a girlfriend, one of the greatest silver linings of this pandemic is that both my teenage boys are stuck at sheltering at home in their rooms. Yes. I was in ecstasy thinking these kids are completely safe and they're forced to spend time with me. And it's all, you know, and I, uh, so I felt really good about it. You know, it never occurred to me that he could get drugs or be exposed to drugs that way or get access to them delivered to the house, like, uh, you know, a delivery menu. And it says that, you know, to your house or shipped anywhere on the ad. And it's not just that ad. I mean, when I tell you, I had to start a a Facebook support group because of the onslaught of parents who are reaching out to me with exactly the same story, like change Sammy's name, change the city, great kid going to college, newly launched. Here's the thing, you know, I don't know another adult. I'm sure there are some that didn't do a couple of stupid things and experiment with a couple of stupid things right. when they were young. And, you know, you kind of expect that you, you do your best to push against it and to protect against it, but you kind of expect that. I certainly didn't, you know, and add to that boredom, adolescent sense of infallibility and immortality, you know, nothing could ever happen to them isolated from their friends, too much energy. And of course, they're going to do stupid things like try to experiment, especially when a dealer reaches out to them with a colorful menu of inexpensive drugs. The problem is, and this like blew my mind, not only that they could access drugs this way and have them delivered to your house while you're sleeping, they'll sneak outside and meet the dealer or when they go for their little walk or bike ride around the neighborhood. But in addition, the deal, the dealers are putting this synthetic opioid that is a hundred times more powerful than morphine and twice as addictive as heroin into the drugs in with no rhyme or reason. They're putting into everything because A, it's unbelievably cheap. B, it makes you a heroin, you know, like a heroin addict times two. So it makes you a phenomenal client. They are targeting kids, especially private school kids or kids in neighborhoods that they think the parents might be able to, you know, sponsor the addiction, so to speak, as the kid starts to become more and more addicted. And that's what would have happened to Sammy if he had lived. He would have been a hardcore addict and fought that for the rest of his life. Uh, Or C, it kills you. Yeah. Because it only takes a few little seeds, teeny tiny seeds of fentanyl, which is like one, I put something on Instagram showing a picture of a penny next to how much fentanyl it takes to kill you. And it's like minuscule compared to a penny. Two grains of salt, they said, two grains of salt. Two grains of salt that can kill you. And the dealers don't care if they kill you. If they don't kill you, they'll make a great customer out of you. And it's coming in through China. This is what the DEA has told us and and the police have told us that the synthetic opioids go into Mexico from China. This is how it's coming into our country primarily because it can't come directly into our country anymore. And then the, they work with the cartel who has laboratories down there that make counterfeit pills or real drugs laced with fentanyl or counterfeit ones that are complete fentanyl. And then they send it through California and the entire United States. Um, and that is 
that's how, you know, so, so not only are kids experimenting, but they're experimenting with things that if it doesn't kill them, will make them like a heroin addict times two. Yeah. And that's, what's so important is one, how easy it is to get. And, you know, you mentioned one of the most heartbreaking things for you. And, and, and I know there have been so many is that, you know, Sammy had no idea what he was consuming. He thought it was one Percocet pill at, at, at the most, but these are not, these are made in a garage in a lab. They're made, you know, they're not, they're not made with any rhyme or reason and they're everywhere. So I was reading, you know, in Omaha, the DEA, like Omaha, Nebraska. Okay. The DEA is reporting a 30% increase in fentanyl seizures, um, after investigators pulled 6.2 kilograms or the equivalent of more than 3 million lethal doses, um, 55,000 counterfeit pills. That's just an Omaha and Salt Lake City. Um, the numbers were half a million counterfeit pills were, were found throughout the country. The DEA is saying they estimate one in every four counterfeit counterfeit pill could could actually create a life-threatening overdose. So this is everywhere. Yes. And every kid who just simply has a phone has access. You know, be a pill, they're putting it in marijuana, they're putting it in cocaine, like whatever the kid takes, they'll give you a little vial of Coke if you want to experiment with that for five bucks or whatever, you know, and it's either pure fentanyl or laced with fentanyl. And so kids who are stupid and bored and have too much energy and want to show off for their friends or want to experiment with something, you know, are doing this and dying. I mean, it is taking our children out. So my question for you, one of my biggest questions for you is we work with parents all the time and, and they will literally say, this is heartbreaking, but this just, this is not going to happen in my family. And, and as you even said, and I, and I watched your exchange with Tamron Hall on this very point, you know, you, you think the most difficult thing they're going to see is pornography, a naked image, cyberbullying. You never think that it's going to come to this. But when organizations like ours will talk about it, you almost see this disconnect with parents. Like, mm, I hear you. I would have thought heard, the same thing. Well, how do we break through that, Dr. Berman? And 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 now I'm asking you as a clinician, is there psych, something like psychologically we can't go there? You know, we can't understand that this risk think- is real? I think we think people who do drugs or I think we as parents think we have a lot more control than we do. First of all, I think that um, we think that the people who die, it's not even an overdose. It's actually murder through poisoning. I don't even want to call it an accidental overdose because yeah, he's sure right. Didn't know what he was taking. He was poisoned and murdered as are the 10,000 other kids of the parents that are currently on our support group. There are 10,000 parents there telling their stories. If you are a parent and you're wondering whether this can happen to your kid, go on that support group, Parents for Safer Children, and look at the beautiful faces of all of these children that look just like yours. Of course, people who are active addicts and struggling with addiction are as as much at as much or more risk as our children are, but they know what's out there. They know about fentanyl. Some of them are even taking it intentionally and their systems are used to opioids and synthetic opioids. So they're not dying as easily, but a child who has never taken anything before or is thinking about experimenting or wants to experiment. And every kid, it seems, you know, think about yourself as a kid and the other kids you knew right? Don't think that you are exempt from this. And kids, you know, are not, they're not addicted. They don't want to become addicted. They have, you know, like Sammy, they have huge dreams and plans. And, you know, he would tell me, we would talk about drugs all the time. And he knew we had addiction in our family and he knew he was at risk. And uh, he was taking something that he thought, you know, if I do this once, it's, I'm bored. It's Super Bowl Sunday. My parents won't let me go out. I'm going to, oh, here's a cool menu. Yeah, I'm going to try it. Why not? You know? And, and and he thought he was possibly taking just a Percocet. I don't know what he thought. He was a like Percocet, Xanax, whatever it was. I don't know what he took yet until the, but he thought he was taking something for fun. Yeah. And you know, some, some of the kids on these, on the support group who died were taking something for pain. You know, one mother just posted a story today about her son who, who did weightlifting competitions and was super clean and injured himself. And someone at the gym gave him, um, some opioid to help with the pain until he could get to the doctor, you know, just a pill. A lot of people take another kid died. 
he had dental pain and couldn't get to the dentist for two weeks because of COVID. And his buddy gave him what he thought was a Percocet to take the edge off until he could get to the doctor. I mean, not that I would ever want my kid to take a Percocet or anything else, you know, but this is, these are the reasons that your kids are taking it. It's not just because they're curious. It's because, you know, but parents think, oh, your kid has to be a total recluse or acting out or have some sort of criminal mind or be a quote unquote bad kid if there is something, you know, or they have to, you know, what, or their parents aren't really attentive yes. or they're really longing for love. No, I mean, yes, all of those things are true. Of course, those things put your kid at risk for drug use and addiction, but that's not what's happening. It's innocent, stupid experimentation that is now lethal, if not turning them into a hardcore addict for the rest of their lives, they'll be fighting it. Online victimization takes many forms, which is why cyber safety remains one of our top priorities. Visit crime-stoppers.org slash cyber-safety to read blog posts, access resource guides, and request a parent or student cyber safety presentation today. I'm curious what you think of this study on statista.com. It was published uh, earlier this year. It says as of March 20, it was published in January 2021, but it says as of March 2020, a survey on parenting in the United States revealed that 70% of parents were very confident regarding their awareness of the types of things their children posted on social media. 67% say they were very confident in knowing what their child watched on television, video games, and as well as social media. Um, do you think that that's true? Like, do parents really know what their kids are doing online? I have no idea, especially, you know, and, and especially if they're on Snapchat, because Snapchat is designed. That's why the kids love it, because everything you post disappears unless someone takes a screenshot of it, which is one of the risks, right? Because if you post something you think is going to disappear and someone takes a screenshot, it hasn't disappeared. But that's why it's so attractive to them. Um, and I think I would have put myself in that category before as someone who, you know, I certainly knew what they were watching and playing. I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't stupid enough to think I knew about exactly what they were posting on social media. And any parent who thinks they know that if you don't know every password to your child's profiles and devices, you have no idea because they give you one profile, you know, they're Snapchat profile, their Instagram profile, but then they have a secret one with their friends that they aren't showing you. So don't think that just because you have access to some profile your kid has that you're seeing what they post. And the big lesson that I learned with this that I have implemented with my 15 year old is I, because they were good kids, didn't get into trouble, did great in school, were high functioning, you know, great kids. I didn't require them to give me their passwords mm. because I want it like, and I hear this from so many parents, I wanted them to have some degree of privacy. I trusted them. You know, I would, I would watch them, you know, but certainly while they're stuck at home, you know, what trouble are they going to get into? And most parents, including me, didn't want to have that battle. Like there was so much of their freedom, especially this year taken away. I didn't want to do that battle with them to require that they give me every password. Now I say to, you know, I said to my 15 year old, look, I pay for every one of those devices that you are using. And if you want to use, and he didn't argue given the circumstances, but if he did, I would have said, you know, if you want to use those devices, I have access to the password for every one of those devices and the password for every one of your platforms. And then you use your own parenting style. Some parents, or if you suspect they may be up to something, you're literally checking. Other parents are just sporadically making sure the passwords work. And I wish I had done that, not only because maybe Sammy would still be alive today, but even now I can't get into his iPhone because was, Apple will not give me the password to his iPhone, even though he's a minor, until I not only have a death certificate, but a court order to get it. And that's where I, I started by saying, I'm not only heartbroken for you as a parent, but I'm angry. I'm angry that Snapchat and social media platforms allow this stuff to be rampant on their website, on their sites. I'm angry that social media, um, I'm sorry, cell phone carriers in these types of situations don't just hand over a phone, say it's your son, your daughter's phone. Of course, take it. We will unlock it immediately. It makes me so angry. 
you know, and I, and I watched you and I, and I watched Mr. Chapman talk about it and it was like, my blood was boiling, but I think enough people are coming together to try to get laws changed to pass this. I hope so. But all, all these social media platforms would have to do is, you know, how, when you make a profile, you agree, right? You click that box. that says, Mm -hmm. I agree Mm -hmm. in that agreement. They would just have to put if you use this platform for any illegal activities yeah. or including X, Y, Z, including drug, you know, dealing drugs or prostitution or anything else that is illegal, your privacy will not be respected yeah. or protected. If they would just put that in there, then they could give the information to the police when the police came to them and said a child died. Here's the profile of that person. Give me their phone number or their address or their credit card information or some little seed of something we can follow. But they won't do that. But why? Why do you think they won't do that? That's the because question. They, because they care more about how many users they have than the users themselves. If they did that, then all then the majority of their nefarious evil doing users who depend on them for this protection will not use their platform. And they know that and they want those users. And so it will significantly affect their bottom line if they protect our children. A. B, they can say, you know, at this point they're held totally harmless. So they have no motivation to protect our children. The second they're held at all you know, not harmless, I guarantee you their difficult algorithms that take a while to be created will quickly change. I I like stand up. I applaud that statement. We've been saying it for the longest times, the longest time they have to be held liable, financially liable, criminally somehow, because, you know, for the longest time, it was the algorithms, the algorithms. Well, then this last year happened and we were, we were quick to notice that they can tag any comment that mentions COVID. They can find, they can weed out speech, speech they don't want to see on their platforms. And they had no problem coming up with solutions for that. But we've been talking about like the exploitation of children, sex trafficking, and now this, and all of a sudden they, they can't figure it out. And it's the most infuriating, infuriating, infuriating that we deal with because, you know, no child should ever come face to face with this. We we have the conversations with parents too that will say no privacy. I respect their privacy and I say I I get it, but you realize we're not just talking about um private chats between Lindsay and her best friend. We're talking about a network that exposes these kids to really difficult things they're not old enough to to navigate. They're not they're not able to figure out. They don't need, know that they're dealing with seasoned predators. They don't know that they're dealing with drug trafficking networks. You know, they don't understand that they're just kids. So they also don't understand, you know, parents don't understand, or they don't think about the fact that our children, this is the first generation that has been raised in the digital world. They are digital natives. They, you know, just like we used to say, oh no, you know, we used to put our kids in the back seat or bring them home from the hospital in our arms. And we used to balk at needing to wear helmets when we rode bikes or, or uh, you know, buckle up for safety or use a car seat in order to take your child home from the hospital. And now no one would question that. Yeah. This is the first generation that is living in this dangerous time. And we as parents need to create. And if all of us came together and required the same thing, I guarantee you our kids would be using social media for connection and good and not for getting into trouble. I guarantee you my son, now that he knows I have all of his passwords, is behaving, even though he wasn't doing anything dangerous beforehand, he's thinking about that with everything he says and every conversation he has, he knows mom and dad could potentially see it. There was an article on uh, fatherly.com that said the big reason why parents should never cyber snoop or monitor their kids online. And it went on to talk about that, you know, the social media world really isn't inherently that dangerous and they need to have their privacy. You and I seem to be on the same page with this, but what is the hardest, you know, the most aggressive message you could give to parents right now who are watching, who who need to digest what we're talking about? I mean, look at my son's story. Look at who this kid is. Look at the article that was written in his school paper about what an amazing, caring, brilliant, sometimes, you know, could teach his classes better than the teachers could, was always helping kids, you know, who were down, was, you know, had his entire entire future ahead of him um, and was an amazing, well-behaved, respectful, 
productive member of society, you know, who could do anything and, and was such a good kid and did something stupid. And all of our kids, and when I talk now to my kid or his friends or other kids, or the parents are talking to their kids about this, just sit down and talk to your kids about what they are seeing. You will be shocked. I guarantee you, your kid has seen drug dealers ads. I guarantee you. That doesn't mean they've responded to those ads, but they've seen them. So do you really want your kid to have privacy in an environment where they are being exposed to rapists, sex traders, drug dealers who are there specifically for your children? Snapchat is a children's platform. That's what, you know, and those people are going there to prey on your children. Would you let your child walk through a drug selling neighborhood in the dark by themselves? No, you wouldn't. So why are you letting them go on social media by themselves? That's the exact thing we tell people all the time. Dr. Berman, as you deal with grief and anger and all of these emotions, where will you channel, where do you want to see the most change? Is it in social laws around social media? Is it around the cell phone industry in just people's households? Where, where I want do- it all to change. <laughs> I want it all to change. I don't know. I'm just taking it one step at a time. I'm talking to a lot of lawmakers, a lot of congressmen, a lot of senators. Um, I, you know, I think social media needs to be held accountable at least for helping to catch people who break the law on their platforms. That is the bare minimum they can give us, okay? And if not, I wanna take them down. And and I want, you know, uh, yeah, I want the, you know, it's the same thing with Apple. They know that kids do not want, if their parents get suspicious to have access to their phone, if kids knew that Apple would give their password, password to their parents, they would not be so excited to get the new incarnation of the next Apple phone. They know what they're doing. It all comes down to the bottom line. And so until these companies are held accountable or their bottom line is affected, then they're not going to change their policies. Um, And the other thing that has just accidentally happened is that, you know, and I think this is because I've done so much deep work on myself my whole life and been through so much trauma and grief, never like this. I mean, this is deeper and wider than anything I ever could have imagined, but, you know, I, I, I know what to do with grief and it is, and it is really, it's not been an area of focus in my work, but it certainly has become very apparent to me that most people in our society have no idea what to do with this kind of pain, how to live with it, how to move it, how to move it into purpose eventually, how to heal from it, how to keep your body from getting sick from it. And I know how to do that. And what I've learned is that as I share my journey vulnerably and snotty and crying and with all its ugliness, um, it helps people. It helps people be with their own pain, whether it's from losing a child or just grief and pain in general. And so, you know, I think that's part of the purpose of all of this too. And the rest will just, you know, reveal itself five minutes at a time. I have no idea, but I know that I'm freaking pissed. And I know that I have thousands and thousands and thousands of parents and lawmakers and media people ready to go to war when I'm clear on what the outcome I want is. Mm -hmm. And that social media better strap on their own seatbelts because this has got to change and it's going to. Well, and we'll join you in that fight and that effort. And I mean, we are so thankful for your time today. And I and I've been battling whether or not to ask you this question, but it keeps popping up in my mind. And, and so maybe we'll ask it and toss it out after. But do you ever find yourself blaming COVID or the lockdowns for, for Sammy's death? Do you think if it hadn't been for these forced lockdowns, he might still be here? He might. I don't know. I mean, I've really I've been through all the what ifs. I have blamed myself. I've thought of every minute of his entire life and something I might have not only on that day, but, you know, when he was three years old, when he was, you know, that's what any parent would do, right? First you blame yourself and then you blame social media and then you blame, you know, the drug dealer and, you know, we're all to blame, but the bottom line is this was a tragedy that could have been avoided. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it, it is senseless and such a loss. It's such a loss to the world that this child 
couldn't grow up and make the contributions to the world that he was going to make. And every child that is lost um, is, is a tragedy and it, and it shouldn't be happening. And it is happening in numbers. I, I can't even wrap my head around, not just my son, but so many children. I mean, it is astounding and it is taking us down from the inside out. Dr. Laura Berman, your story is one that continues to touch us. Again, we're an organization that has been talking about these issues, really sounding the alarm on the role of social media and the negligence that it, it's creating in all of our homes. And if we can help you in any way, we will do that with our full support. Um, we'll continue to watch what you're doing. We thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Of course. Thank you. And we'll be back next week, guys. Thank you so much. Thanks for tuning in to today's Balanced Conversation. You can find real solutions and tangible resources in our show notes at thebalancevoicepodcast.com. To join the conversation, follow us on Instagram at thebalancevoicepodcast and on Twitter at balancevoice underscore. Stay up to date on Renya's work by following her at The Renya Report. And we can't wait to see you next week for another Balanced Conversation.